millions of people just living out their lives oblivious. Unfortunately, no one can be told what the Matrix is. You have to see it for yourself. There's something wrong. There's something wrong. You don't know what it is. You don't know what it is. You don't know what it is. Like a splinter. Like a splinter. Driving you mad. Driving you mad. Driving you Bring the ship up to broadcast depth. We're going in. Taking Neo to see her. See who? The Oracle. Hey folks, welcome aboard. We're uh, glad you could join us uh, in what we hope to be another round of interesting uh, and thought-provoking discussion. Uh, we've got a, a, a very special guest tonight. We're really excited to have him on the podcast. Uh, our guest for this evening is Bill Harris of Centerpoint Research Institute. Uh, Bill's a certified trainer in neurolinguistic programming, uh, also called NLP, uh, and uh, is trained in Erickson hypnosis. He's uh, a longtime student of uh, contemporary psychology, Eastern philosophy, uh, and the physical sciences. The evolution of nonlinear systems, or chaos theory, and the effects of a wide range of uh, neurotech um, uh, technologies uh, uh, on human change, evolution, and healing. He also talks quite a bit about uh, neuroplasticity, which we're going to get into. Fascinating discussion. It's about um, the... Uh, the brain's ability to, to train itself and, uh, and learn uh, fascinating stuff. Bill's known for his ability to explain difficult subjects in an engaging and easy-to-understand way. Uh, he's a frequent speaker at scientific and transformational forums and conferences across the U.S. and around the world. Uh, he's a very easy guy, uh, guy to talk to. Uh, we had a lot of fun in this interview. learned quite a bit. Um, Bill's going to be uh, breaking down a, a technology that he created known as Holosync, which is the original version of Binaural Beats that we talked about in our previous episode. Um, we'll also explore uh, any synergistic crossovers between NLP uh, and hypnosis if we uh, get a chance to delve into that. Uh, his time is going to be pretty limited, so this is going to be a, a short interview. We're happy we could, uh, could get him on the show and... Uh, uh, hope you guys enjoy the episode. Thanks. As always, our sponsor for the show is BlueRoseAlchemy.com, my own business uh, for metaphysical supplies and uh, ritual uh, supplies and materials. Uh, we've got a great collection of uh, blessed sage sticks, ritual incense, and uh, a couple other tools that are really helpful. We also uh, make uh, laboratory samples of Ormus available for the public. If you don't know what Ormus is, you definitely want to go check out the website at bluerosealchemy.com. Uh, it's literally changed my life, uh, completely overhauled um, uh, the way I look at the world. And uh, yeah, it, it's good stuff. Uh, so we're going to jump into the interview. Thanks, guys. Well, I'm the one that that actually uh, was was seeking you out <laughs> today, Bill. I, I was I've been trying to to get a hold of you for quite a while to to do an interview because uh, we talk about all different kinds of things on our podcast, and I thought, man, that would be awesome to get Bill on here to talk about all the stuff that that he's done uh, with with Centerpoint because it's kind of funny how I found out about you too. Uh, I was in been in internet marketing for a very long time and. I got an email one time and it said something about that. Well, this, this guy's, uh, what he's selling, people buy it and they keep coming back. He's got the, the most customers that come back of any other product out there right now. And I, I, I don't even know what product it was. I'm assuming it was your initial center point product. But I started researching that to see what can somebody sell that, that sells it so well that people just keep coming back for, for more products from this guy. And it ended up being the center point product. So you've been involved in that in, for quite a while, haven't you? Uh, well, I started playing around with what became uh, Holosync 29 years ago and uh, started Centerpoint 25 year, about 25 and a half years ago now. So it's been a, been a long time. Well, I, I knew it had been at least probably 10 years since I even heard about it. Um, but back when I heard about it, you know, nowadays when you go online and you, and you look at things, uh, products that are similar, and I'm, I'm going to ask you in a minute to actually explain exactly what what Holosync does. But um, 
back in the day, there, there wasn't really common knowledge about binaural beats and, and trying to get in different states like, uh, d- you know, theta and, and delta and all this. I, you just didn't see anything about it. So I'm kind of curious, h- how did you come about this technology or, or find out about it? And I understand you developed Holosync. So let's see if you could talk to us a little bit about how that came about and how it's different from, uh, or if, you know, how much it is different from binaural beats and things like that. Well, I I actually grew up very unhappy and uh, messed up. And uh, somebody suggested when I was about 19 that I should meditate, calm myself down a little bit. And uh, I was angry. I was depressed. I was unhappy in many ways. And uh, so I started meditating when I was 19, which was a long time ago. I'm 65. And... I was a type A personality, so I really did it in a pretty disciplined way, and it did help in many ways, but still, 16 years later, in 1985, when I was 35, um, I was still not a very happy camper, and I uh, drove a lot of people away because I was angry and didn't know how to deal with it. I had low emotional intelligence I guess you could say. And about that time, I I, uh, I ran into some research that led to Holosync. And the, the first bit of it I had known about for a while, uh, back in the 1970s, um, there was a lot of research done on the electrical patterns in the brain that people were making when they meditated. So they knew what the brainwave patterns were of meditation uh, already. Then I ran across this article, which actually also was written in the 1970s, a rather obscure article by a researcher at Mount Sinai Medical Center in New York, a man named Dr. Uh, Gerald Oster. And it was, to, to simplify it, it was describing a way to change brainwave patterns using sound. And he actually wasn't giving any use for it anyway. It was a very, very technical kind of article. But I looked at at these two pieces of information and I said, gee, if these are the brainwave patterns of meditation and this is a way to change brainwave patterns, could we change them to those of meditation? And what would that be like? And would it work? And would you get the same the same results and so on? So I gathered together some equipment that I really didn't know much about or how to use. And I bought a few things, and I, down in my basement in sort of mad scientist mode, I began making these cassette tapes, because this was before uh, even CDs were, I think CDs existed, but they weren't really in general use. Right. Be, but anyway, I was making these cassette tapes of with this technology on it and trying different things to... Uh, you know, see what would happen. And I had a couple friends that were trying this with me, and we were quite frankly blown away by what happened. Not only did we have these incredibly deep, powerful meditations, and we were high on our own neurochemicals when we were finished and so on, but all these changes began happening to each of us. And for me, it was... Uh, I stopped being angry, uh, I stopped being depressed, I became more creative, I, m- my m- mental clarity increased. All these changes happened to me that uh, really kind of blew me away. And after about four years of that, by that time we had maybe 150 people across the United States and in Europe who just through word of mouth – uh, had contacted me and said, hey, will you make me one of those? And and so anyway, people started coming to me and saying, you should really uh, create a structured way to use this and sell it. And I had, I you know, I really just made it for myself. I was not into having a business. I was not a businessman. Um, I, you know, I didn't sort of rub my hands together and say, oh boy, am I going to get rich or anything like that? I, <laughs> I, I was making about $30,000 a year at the time and I thought, wow, maybe I could like make another $30,000 a year and then I'd double my income and that would be, 
beyond amazing. And so, you know, I started the business. I didn't know much about having a business. And it took me quite a few years to kind of figure it out. But the thing about what we you know, started to call Holosync is that it really, really works. It really changes people. I have, I have thousands and thousands. I have so many testimonial letters from people, many of which were sent to me before you could just zip out an, an email. These were people that took out a piece of paper, wrote down something by hand, found an envelope, found a stamp, put it in the mailbox, you know, that sort of thing. And we weren't asking for them. But at any rate, I, I have, you know, of just ones that I that I managed to keep over the years, I have over 300 pages of them uh, in like a Word doc. And uh, over 2 million people in 193 countries have now used it. And, you know, the answer to your first question was why do people come back to this it's because it really changes people people these letters say this changed my life this changed my son's life i I spoke at a conference in denver a couple years ago on uh, around new year's eve you know new year's and uh people walking through the halls in the hotel uh, every 20 feet, somebody would come up to me and say, um, you're Bill Harris. You saved my life. You saved my son's life. You know? So that's the real, that's the real uh, reason why, why uh, you're, you're hearing that uh, people keep coming back. It's a, it's a progressive program where we make it a bit stronger a step at a time. So they, you go through it a little by little. So I guess it uh, is it kind of like any other muscle in your body that the more you use it, the stronger it gets. So you have to uh, go further and further with. It. Is that is that kind of the idea? Well, you're talking about something near and dear to my heart now, which is uh, something called neuroplasticity. It, it used to be that scientists thought that by the time you grew up, you were just you were stuck with whatever brain you had. But uh, over the last twenty or thirty years. Uh, the the thinking has really changed in 180 degrees, in fact. And now uh, they know that anything you do repeatedly, a thought you think repeatedly, a sensory impression you have repeatedly, any movement you make repeatedly, anything you practice repeatedly, all all that kind of stuff causes your brain to turn over more neural real estate to doing it. So for instance, mm. if you are anxious a lot, you'll get really good at being anxious because more of your brain will be get turned over to creating anxiety or depression or anger or unhappiness or uh, brain fog or anything. But also, uh, if you, you know, you want to play the piano or, you know, or play the violin or become a good speaker or a good writer or learn a foreign language or any, any uh, ability, if you practice it, your brain turns over more real estate to doing it. So when you use Holosync, well, I mean, let's start with when you just meditate in a traditional way. When you meditate in a traditional way, uh, you're slowing your brainwave patterns from the typical beta brainwave pattern that most people are in all the time down into a slower, calmer alpha brainwave pattern. And if you do that a lot, your brain gets really good at, at making alpha. And uh, there's many benefits of alpha. It's uh, you're much more focused. Uh, um, you, super, what they call super learning happens in alpha. Uh, you are um, you're able to learn faster, take in more information. You feel more joy. You feel uh, more equanimity. You feel more comfortable in your own skin. All this sort of thing. And you know, long time meditators are known for for being more focused and more uh, having more awareness and this sort of thing. So when you use Holosync, we're taking you not only through alpha, but also through an even slower theta brainwave pattern, which is the brainwave pattern of creativity. It's also the brainwave pattern of putting what you've learned into long-term storage so you remember it better. Uh, it's where people have visionary experiences when they're meditating. It's, where, it's, it's the brainwave pattern of dreaming 
when you're dreaming at night. Uh, and also people have something really interesting happen in Theta, what are called uh, integrative experiences, which is where uh, sometimes, you know, many times in life actually, people are faced with situations where they see things a certain way. And sometimes the way they're seeing things is a roadblock to them. And they can't see their way out of it. And uh, when uh, somebody has an, what's an integrative experience, they suddenly their perspective changes. They see things in a whole new way. They, they see things from a higher spot on the mountaintop. And uh, that allows them to, um, to be more aware of what's going on and to navigate their life better. You know, uh, an example would be, you know, you you get married when you're young and you're so in love and all that sort of thing and you're you're really happy and you think, wow, I'm going to be married to this person for the rest of my life and life is good and so on and so forth. And then something happens, the, uh, your partner has a, an affair or you just sort of fall out of love or something and the whole idea that you could lose that had never really occurred to you. And so you go into a depression, you know, you, you break up with somebody and you, and you have a really hard time for a while. And then though, you, if, if you have an integrative experience, you suddenly have this moment where you kind of get it and you say, okay, this is part of life. Sometimes there are losses. Sometimes you get close to someone and it doesn't work out for some reason or somebody betrays you or something. And you create a new model of reality that includes that as a possibility but until you did that you were really struggling so uh, there are many kinds of integrative experiences though I mean you could just uh, have a problem uh, you know let's say you have a problem with your parents you can't get along with one of your parents or something and then something shifts for you and you suddenly are able to let your parent be who they are without it freaking you out, even though it's not what you would prefer. You, you, you get what I'm saying? Yeah, I, I know exactly what you mean. In fact, I've, I've seen it even in myself where you'll, you'll get maybe on a negative pattern for just a short period of time and suddenly you'll get in a spiral and you'll, you'll kind of start feeling the same way about life every day. And you can really get stuck for a long time if you don't do what you're talking about and have some kind of, a, kind of an epiphany or a change in your worldview. Yeah, exactly. So anyway, that happens in a theta brainwave pattern. And then and then the slowest brainwave pattern is uh, delta. And delta is uh, deep sleep, dreamless sleep. But um, very ad people that are very advanced spiritually can create what is called waking delta, where they're not asleep. And it's associated with what in Eastern philosophy they call kundalini awakenings, where this energy goes up the spine and opens the chakras and all that sort of stuff. And it's also associated with uh, being very persuasive and charismatic. Uh, people that uh, can make waking delta are often great leaders. If they're evil assholes, though, they might be evil great leaders. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know... Uh, a friend of mine, Dr. James Hart, who has uses biofeedback to teach people to make these brainwave patterns, he won't teach people to make Delta until they've handled all their emotional crap because if they haven't, uh, mm. they can be kind of dangerous because it's – so at any rate, what we do with Holosync is we take you through all of these brainwave patterns and because your brain is plastic, it has this – a neuroplasticity quality, um, you get better and better at making these brainwave patterns. And uh, that means that when you uh, are in a situation and you need to be more creative or you need to learn or you need to have a broader perspective or you need to be calmer or uh, more focused or whatever it happens to be, and I, and I probably only mentioned three percent of all the qualities that each of these brainwave patterns has then because you have learned to go into them you naturally go into them so that you can do whatever you need to do and actually there's one more brainwave pattern that they just started really looking at a lot uh, around 2005 when uh, a scientist at uh, 
University of Wisconsin-Madison. His name is uh, Dr. Uh, Richard Davidson. Most people call him Richie Davidson. But he uh, scanned the brains of these Tibetan Buddhist monks that hang around with the Dalai Lama. And um, among other things, they found that these guys were making tons and tons of gamma waves, which are actually faster than beta waves. At the higher end of beta, which is the normal brainwave pattern people, most people are making most of the time, you start to feel anxious, kind of a sense of disease. And so it's kind of ironic that if you get even faster, you make these gamma waves, which are associated with loving kindness and compassion. And these, you know, the, the Dalai Lama and these other monks that are around him are known for that. And they found when they scanned their brains that they were making lots of, of gamma waves. So the point is, though, that as you meditate in, in a traditional way, uh, you're changing your brain waves, although it takes decades to get to the point where you might be making some of the, the slower ones. With Holosync, you can start making them the first time you use it and every time. And it really accelerates the whole process of getting the the awareness, the the, the focus and concentration, the the emotional equanimity, the happiness, the, the joy, and all those things that you get from meditation uh, in having done this now for 29 years, we estimate that Holosync makes this process happen eight times faster than traditional meditation because, you know, it's just like a car allows you to get from point A to point B a lot faster than a walking or riding a horse or riding a bicycle or, or whatever. You know, technology can speed things up. And, uh, and it really works, which is why you heard what you heard about about people, uh, you know, once they start it, sticking with it. Now, I know, like you were saying, it has several different levels, but at some point, and I was going to ask you at what point in the program, do you integrate the person's uh, voice? I know you have them say certain phrases and things like that. Right. Could you talk about how that gets integrated in with the Holosync program? Well, the first level of the program is called Awakening Prologue. And people do that for at least four months, um, uh, four to six months. Some people stay with it longer. Um, one of the things that it, that it does is it, it brings up the unconscious, unresolved stuff that people have and resolves it. And people, some people, it takes longer to do that for a variety of reasons. One reason could be that they, that they, um, uh, have a lot of it because they've been traumatized in their life. And another one could be, and this is sort of related to the first one, that they resist this stuff coming up. It is it is the unpleasant stuff. It's the same kind of stuff that comes up if somebody goes to a therapist or something. It's just stuff you don't really want to look at. We have a lot of support to help people through this, and it doesn't have to be difficult. We show people how to kind of observe it instead of getting involved in it and resisting it. Uh, anyway, I'm sort of getting off track from your question, but people people stay in this first level awakening pro for varying lengths of time, and uh, there are certain signs that you're done with it. And I, I don't want it to sound like people are just having all this weird stuff happening because I would say almost always people are feeling kind of high from doing this and the that stuff is going on in the background all by itself and, and it but sometimes it does come to the surface. At any rate, when they when people say, Wow, this is amazing and I want to go into the next uh stronger level of Holosync where we do some things with the technology to make it more powerful, to have it, you know, it's a stronger stimulus to the brain. At that time we also add uh affirmations, silent affirmations, um that are chosen by the participant and recorded in their own voice. And many years ago, we were using just traditional subliminal affirmations. But I realized after a while and, and looked at the research on them too, and they don't, they don't really work. It's, un unfortunately, it's just plain bullshit. 
<laughs> Which specific ones were you talking about? Uh, Subliminal affirmations. Okay, that that explains something. Then I know I've always followed Anthony Robbins' work, and a long time ago he had these tapes called holophonic subliminals, and supposedly it was positive messages that you couldn't audibly hear. And he just kind of stopped talking about it. So I, I guess something came out about that that it wasn't effective or something. Yeah, well, there's plenty of people that do think it's effective because they think they they because they don't have any scientific background and they don't under they don't understand how things like this work. And there's a lot of people that just want to believe in magic. Um, at any rate, I uh, I happened to run across some research that was done at the I, I'm pretty sure it was the Medical College of Georgia, and. Uh, I look at a lot of research, so I, uh, it's either that or the University of Virginia, but I'm pretty sure it was the Medical College of Georgia. And it was – these guys were trying to uh, communicate, figure out a way to communicate with people who are profoundly deaf. And they found that if they took spoken word and frequency modulated it to – uh, you know, way up into the dog whistle range, the same way that they, this is the same way that an FM radio works. They frequency modulate the signal so that it's out of the hu- hu- range of human hearing and then they send it over, you know, send it through the air and the, your radio picks it up and demodulates it so that you can hear the radio station. Um, they, um, they did this with spoken language and they were using bone conduction Um because the people were deaf, and they found that that people could understand what was being said, and so I said, "Well, gee, the people using Holosync are have have uh, headphones on their ears, and there is bone conduction happening, and so we began to experiment with using this, and our trademark name for the way we do it is called autophonics, and that's how we do it. There the the messages are not subliminal, which means below the range of hearing. They are just as loud as everything else on the soundtrack, but it's it's up at a very high frequency that most people can't consciously hear. A uh, few people can hear a little sort of squeaky sound um, if they have really really good upper range hearing. But um, but at any rate, that's that's what we do, and the reason that we do it is because when you listen to Holosync and you're in these slower brainwave patterns, you are very suggestible. You, uh, you're very open to learning and taking in information. Your, your mind is sort of like a sponge. And since m- most of us are talking to ourselves all the time and often in a very negative way, we thought, well, what if you could talk to yourself in an extremely positive way and you could do it when you're in the most suggestible state. And so we added that. Um, I often have to remind people, though, that the real power behind this is the holosync, not the affirmations. Some people obsess about the affirmations. Um, uh, that's just a little add-on that we did because uh, because it, it just added another element to it. So... Hey, Bill, if I can, uh, I'm just kind of sitting back and absorbing the, the massive amount of knowledge you're throwing out. Um, you touched on something that made my brain kind of click in for a second, and I wonder if we could go back to the um, beta, delta, gamma discussion. You know, specifically, you were talking about um, high-functioning folks who were uh, hanging around the, the Dalai Lama, and they seem to be operating in the, the gamma wavelength Uh did I, did I grab that correctly? I don't know if they're making them all the time, um, but um, they their brain has been trained to make the whole range of these brainwave patterns, which is what we do with Holosync too. And uh, so when uh, – uh, the way that the, these monks have described it is that when they see someone who's suffering, they feel uh, – they feel an incredibly strong, or I for, I'm trying to think of the exact words they use, uh, but they feel just an unsuppressible urge to to help. Right. To to you know, and and uh, I am a, Bo- a Zen Buddhist monk myself, uh, not a Tibetan Buddhist monk, but in Buddhism you take a vow to to uh, save all sentient beings from suffering. And you do it actually knowing that sentient beings 
In fact, the, the, the vow goes, sentient beings are sufferless. I vow to save them all. Or are, are numberless. I, uh, I vow to save them all. So knowing that it's impossible to save them all, you still make that vow. And so these guys are, are really embodying that sort of thing because they're, they're really trying to. Um... So anyway, you had a question about the gamma waves, though. Wonder just, uh, I'm not really familiar with uh, musical theory, but it sort of struck me that you may be dealing with an octave situation. Maybe these guys are getting really good at, uh, at manifesting and the, the lower brave, uh, wavelengths that are, are really beneficial. And because they get really good at that, they naturally shift up. Uh, I wonder if gamma is maybe an octave above one of the, the key lower, uh, frequencies. Well, uh, that's kind of an interesting idea. Um, one of the things we have, you know, certainly all, all sounds have overtones. And uh, so, for instance, um, if we try to uh, put some headphones on someone and create delta waves, let's say uh, uh, two cycle per second delta waves, um, if they are sitting there making uh, 14 cycle per second um, beta waves, two is a long ways away from that. It's going to be very difficult to uh, to entrain or you know create uh, those slower waves. And so, instead, they may create an overtone of that two cycle per second, which could be four or eight or 16. Um, and, you know, if, uh, f four cycles per second is, is an octave above two cycles per second and eight cycles per second is an octave above. Now you see, these are very low, uh, very low frequencies because, uh, the, you know, the note they tune up to in the, in the, uh, orchestra is a 440. And uh, that's a lot higher sound. The low, right. I, I, I don't really know off the top of my head what the frequency of the lowest note on the piano is, but uh, these are considerably below that. Even the, even, the, um, even the gamma waves are very low frequencies um, compared to, the, you know, what, you know, music that you would hear. But, th but th that, that's possible. I don't think anybody knows now uh, why somebody is making gamma waves, but they do know that when they practice certain meditation techniques, it increases their ability to do that. And certainly taking people through them using something like Holosync increases your ability uh, to do it too. I, um, I'm not trying to make myself sound great or anything, but I, I, <laughs> I, I've made a lot of money because of Holosync, and I give, I've given millions of dollars to charities uh, helping kids in various ways. I've built about 10 schools in uh, Kenya, and I, uh, I've given lots of money to other uh, charities that help inner-city kids and homeless kids and all that sort of thing. And I pretty much, before Holosync, was pretty self-absorbed and didn't really care that much about anybody else unless they were doing something that, that you know, I could take advantage of that would help me in some way. If I would meet somebody, I would quickly ascertain whether they were of use to me at all. And if they weren't, I would probably begin to ignore them. Um, but, you know, doing Holosync for quite a number of years really changed me a lot so that uh, one of the main things uh, on my mind while I'm interacting with anybody, or even if I'm not interacting with them, but certainly if I'm interacting with them, is what's going on for them and, and uh, how are they experiencing things and how what effect am I having on them. I used to have a pretty bad effect on people, and uh, I was even I was unaware of it and didn't care. So from a layman's perspective, it, I mean, if I were to try to sum this up, it basically sounds like meditation in a box on an audio track. Uh, and it, it just sort of reprograms your ability to think uh, and sort of emotionally reprograms you to be a little more compassionate. Would you say that's uh, a fair assessment? Except I would say a lot more. 
Uh, it makes you <laughs> a lot more focused, a lot happier, a lot calmer, a lot uh, better learner, a lot uh, more creative, uh, and so on. It, and it doesn't happen overnight. This isn't a 30-day miracle, but it happens way faster than with uh, than with traditional meditation. I just wrote a book, um, by the way. I don't even know if you guys knew about this. It's called um, The New Science of Super Awareness. And I think we can put something on your blog so that after people hear this, they can get a free copy of it. Uh, oh, I'd awesome. be happy to give them a free copy of it. But the, the book is, uh, I don't know, there's a lot of stuff about new research that's been done on the brain, particularly regarding meditation, but also re- regarding flow states, um, willpower, and self-regulation. In other, in other words, the ability to be to control yourself, you might say. Right. And um, and also something called heart rate variability. But in the book, I start off talking about awareness because my kind of cardinal principle is that awareness creates choice um Mm, people are people are are creating a number of things in their life but they're doing it outside their awareness when you create something outside your awareness it happens on automatically it doesn't happen intentionally uh, and it often just seem, seems like it just happens. And without going into all the background of how I came to this conclusion, there are really four areas of life that every person creates, although they're almost entirely doing it outside their awareness. The first one is how you feel, and that would include other things like uh, states that aren't really feelings, but they're internal states like uh, optimism, courage, uh, anxiety, I guess anxiety is a feeling, uh, motivation, things like that, uh, that, that aren't exactly feelings in the emotional sense, but they are internal states. So, so it's how you feel, how you behave, which people and situations you are attracted to or attract to you, mm, and, okay. what, and what meanings you assign what you decide, the things that are hap- happening around you mean, which it plays a huge role in your life. So th- there are this whole stream of internal cognitive events that people are doing inside their head uh, that generate those things. I mean, most people are aware of the results of those things. They can, they're aware of how they're feeling. They're aware of how they're behaving. They can see who they're attracting or becoming attracted to or what situations they're attracting. And they can, they, you know, but most people are adding meanings without realizing they're doing it. Uh, right. they, they just say, wow, that, you know, that happened. That means uh, he doesn't like me. That means I'm not very smart. That means, um, you know, everything's stacked against me that mean what you know there's all kinds of things people s- decide that whatever happened meant um, most people don't really understand till somebody points it out that all those meanings come from you they don't right. they don't come from the world they're not intrinsic to the world they're they're they come from you and uh, so any at any rate if you have little awareness those things will just happen based on how you were programmed, your mind was programmed by your early experiences. If you have a lot of awareness, which I now know is not some sort of airy-fairy sort of thing, it's it's actually a certain way that your brain is set up. Uh, and we can talk about that in just a second. But Because that's what happens when you meditate, you become more aware. And as you become more aware, you have more choice about those four areas of life, you begin to see how you're generating them, which is different than seeing the, the consequences of them after you have generated. You actually see how you start creating them. And once you see yourself create something with awareness, if it doesn't serve you, you just can't keep doing it. It's just, you know, it just would be completely counterintuitive to keep doing something that is uh, not in your best interest to do. 
uh, when you see how you're creating it. A lot of people see the results of what they've done and that that isn't in their best interest. That obviously seeing that doesn't help very, very often anyway. So I'm simplifying this a lot because the whole brain science behind this is rather complex. But you, you've got kind of two competing engines in your brain, you might say. One is... Uh, your li- your limbic system, which is deep inside your brain. It's a more primitive part of your brain. Uh, it's sometimes called the reptilian brain, but it's where you generate uh, the fight-or-flight impulse. It's where you generate right. reactivity. It's where your emotions come from. It's where desire comes from. It's what makes you eat that 15th donut <laughs> when you said you weren't going to eat any. Um, right. You know, it's what it what it's what makes you attracted to somebody else. Um, you know, another person. Uh, you know, have sexual attract, attraction, relationship attraction, that sort of thing. But it's it's what makes you want it now, instead of looking at long term consequences. The other part of your brain is a more uh, more recently evolved part of your brain, the prefrontal cortex behind your forehead, and the prefrontal cortex is the source of long-range planning, executive function, um, uh, considering long-term consequences, uh, self-regulation, uh, and certainly uh, in- intuition and a lot of uh, left-brain thinking also. So what happens when you meditate and much more quickly happens when you use Holosync is that more and more brain real estate is turned over to your prefrontal cortex and all these executive functions and the ability to keep in mind the long-term consequences of something and more connections are created between your prefrontal cortex and your limbic system. So that if you sit there and you look at that donut and you go, wow, that looks good and you imagine what it's going to taste like and all that kind of stuff. If you have enough awareness, your prefrontal cortex says, yes, but um, <laughs> the that whole experience will be over in about a minute and the experience of gaining the weight and feeling that logy feeling you get after you eat a whole bunch of sugar and and – what it does to your chemistry and your body and all that and all the negative things is n- it's not worth it. So you, you you know you decide not to do it. It's the same way with deciding that you're gonna you're going to exercise instead of blowing it off or or uh, that you're not gonna jump down somebody's throat. That you can step back and have more self control. And then there's some even more interesting stuff because when you look at um, at geniuses um, and, or p- just people that are able to enter into flow states and do amazing things like a basketball star making the, the last minute shot over and over and over again and things like that, it's because actually not only is the prefrontal cortex stronger, but in those moments, most of it shuts down and only the part you need um, is, uh, is active which means that everything seems like it's happening in slow motion and mm. you're you can all your capabilities are going into doing one thing a lot of this they found with like these guys doing these death defying skateboarding tricks or or doing base jumping where they're jumping off these you know rock cliffs uh with a parachute or you know, surfing 80, 100 foot waves. They're doing things where they can die and it throws them into a flow state. And in that flow state, um, everything in the brain shuts off except what they need to get feedback about what they're doing and do it in an excellent way. Of course, you have to have practiced doing these things. But um, the reason that... um, like I'm a jazz musician, for instance, and the reason that I can improvise and play jazz, which is going by way too fast to think your way through, is because I can enter a flow state, shut down, not intentionally, it just happens, uh, the parts of the prefrontal cortex that would sit there and say, well, let's see, what would be a good thing to play next? Um, well, that's all. there's a whole bunch of choices. Which one should I, you know, you can't do that. So instead, another part of your brain takes over. 
and just it just flows through you. It comes out of you. So these are all kind of states of super awareness, which is why I called the book The New Science of Super Awareness. And so it, it turns out that uh, as certain changes happen in your brain, uh, you can make more of these brainwave patterns. You uh, have more self-regulation. You can overrule your limbic system when it, it wants to make you do stupid stuff. Uh, you can uh, learn faster. You can be more intuitive. All these things happen. And so the book is really kind of describing all the cool stuff that the scientists have found about found out about the brain. And a lot of this stuff was not related to meditation. But then when I looked at the research into meditation, I found out that the same parts of the brain were being turned on or off when people meditated. And I said, aha, that's why uh, when people meditate for a long time, they can enter flow states more easily. They have more self-regulation. They can uh, be more self-disciplined. They can, you know, make all these brain waves and all that all that sort of stuff. So at any rate, if people click on, uh, uh, I assume, you know, we haven't done this as we're recording this, but I'm assuming we can have people click on a link uh, below the player they're listening to this on uh, somewhere in your blog and, uh, uh, and they can download a free copy of this book. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, I wanted to ask you one specific question. You just touched on it a minute ago, talking about the brain and when you make connections and, and state of mind. Uh, I wanted to use kind of like an example. Let's say that I get in uh, kind of a, a really bad state of mind, and I decide that I want to listen to a piece of music to get myself in a better frame of mind so I can handle my problems. And I know you're familiar with neurolinguistic programming. Um I'm curious, at what point does it change from me going to listen to this music that already makes me feel good so that when I listen to it, I get in a better mood to the point where I end up ruining that song and make it a negative neuro association to me because every time I go to listen to that song, I'm already in a bad state of mind. How, how do those two things work uh, with each other? Well, that's a – that's a uh-oh. Can you hear me? Yep, we got uh, oh, Okay. I took off my headset for just a second and put it back on, and it sounds different to me now. Uh, you oh. know, I don't really know for sure the answer to that question. Um, I, uh, I, I know, for instance, that if I don't get in a bad state of mind very often, but if I do, uh, one of the things that I might be inclined to do would be put on my headphones and listen to some Holosync. And I have certainly, especially years ago, would be in a bad state and put on Holosync, and and it certainly did not become a, a negative, uh, you know, anchor that the Holosync meant negativity. Um, I don't know. It would be. Yeah, I, I can see how you it would be different because that's actually putting your brain in a very specific frequency. Whereas when you listen to something, you're just going off the auditory anchors of it. You know, if you uh, if if you uh, you know like the term comfort food, you know, you're feeling stressed and then you sit down and you eat something that's like comfort food, which generally is stuff that's not good for you, by the way. But, but, mm -hmm. but you don't begin to associate the comfort food with something bad. As soon as you see it, you feel a little bit better. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. You know, if you have a friend that, uh, that you uh, talk to when you're having a hard time and and you so you're having a hard time and you call him up and then you get to his house and you go in and you sit down immediately you start to feel better because you're with there with your friend and it you know it starts to change your state so i think it's it's more likely that 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 that's going to happen yeah i would agree it sounds like the the holosync is an active programming uh as opposed to uh, just sort of a, a reflective experience of listening to your favorite yeah, music. Yeah, it's it's a it's a, a neuroplasticity stimulus that uh, changes your brain, and it happens to change your brain in some really 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 positive ways. And you know, you can do it a slow. Yeah, I got a couple of other discs with the program. I got Awakening Prologue. It's been a long time ago. Um, 
but it came with something called super longevity and making change easy, which uh, when I was looking at these recently researching them, I, I understand that they put you in different brainwaves. That's the whole the whole point of uh, of the different CDs there. But uh, I just realized that they're specific for specific things like learning and, and uh, ca- calming down and things like that. Well, super longevity. I made that in collaboration with um, Dr. Vincent Giampapa. And I, I talk about him in the book because he did a study on Holosync quite a few years ago, uh, about 15 or 16 years ago. And uh, when I looked him up uh, on the Internet, he just has been nominated for a Nobel Prize. He's a, a doctor in the field of uh, anti-aging medicine. And uh, uh, he, he – well, anyway, I, to, to get back to the question, instead of going off on a tangent about him, he's a very interesting guy. But um, – one of the things that they, the neuroplasticity researchers found out is that actually your genes are even plastic in the sense that certain uh, environmental stimuli, the same stuff that would cause a neuroplastic change in your brain, can activate or deactivate genes. And uh, so there are silent autophonics affirmations on there. On the on those soundtracks that are designed to that that he created the affirmations not me that um, that are designed to facilitate positive changes in in genes and then we're putting you into a very you know uh, receptive state with the holosync on that that's that's uh, sort of that's not a main uh, part of a, of the program really that that soundtrack but it is a cool soundtrack. Yeah, we're you know we have we do have a few soundtracks that are for specific purposes, um, you know to become more focused or to be more creative or something like that. But real the the main part of the program really is to just create overall increase in awareness, so that so that you're creating a brain that is like that of these these monks that are around the Dalai Lama, for instance, Um, rather than uh, I I would say that having a soundtrack that is designed to address a certain problem that people has is kind of a lesser way to use this. Although, um, you know, we have a lot of knockoff artists that quite frankly don't really understand this technology. I've been doing this a long time time and most of them I kind of compare the knockoff artists to if I was the world's greatest pastry chef and uh, and then somebody else had a copy of the joy of cooking and they were making pastries and claiming they were as good as mine because they had butter and flour and sugar in them and I don't eat pastries but so maybe that's not a good example but uh, uh, there are a lot of other "Quote unquote binaural beat or brain entrainment things around, where quite frankly people, because we're bigger than all of them put together, they uh, they all try to say they're the the same as what we're doing, but they they aren't. But so here I've drifted off again <laughs> onto another subject. But uh, anyway, I I think that using this for specific subjects is uh, is a uh, sort of treating the symptoms because when you when you become more aware. You see, as I said, awareness mm. creates choice. And once you have a choice, you stop creating all the things that um, aren't serving you. They just fall away. So that that allows all the negative symptoms you have to to clear up. And usually what happens if you try to treat one specific symptom, if you haven't treated the fundamental thing about you, that generated that symptom, which is really a lack of awareness, then, uh, you know, it's just putting a Band-Aid on something. So we're going right to the making the fundamental change that underlies all the problems. In fact, what I often say is that awareness provides the solution to all of life's problems that have a solution. Because some problems in life don't have a solution. There's there's no solution, for instance, to the fact that everything is impermanent. 
everything comes into being, is here for a while and goes away. So, you know, human beings are continually uh, faced with uh, losses of some kind because people die, things end, uh, your your car you love, you know, gets old and falls apart. Uh, you know, you have a dog you love and it gets old and it dies and, you know, there's all that stuff and then we don't have any control over earthquakes and the sun and gravity and that we have sensitive bodies and you know there's a whole lot of thing and and you may have, you guys may have noticed this too i i find that as much as i used to try to do this i cannot control what other people do and they <laughs> and and everybody has their own agenda and very often other people's agenda uh conflicts with yours or really gets in the way of yours. So there's there's all these things in life that you can't have. You really don't have much of a choice about. But you can have a choice about how you feel, how you behave, which people and situations you attract or become attracted to, and what meanings you assign to things. And if you can create a choice about those four things, you'll have about as good a life as it's possible to have. Bill, have you ever heard of uh, the Four Agreements? Has that ever crossed your desk? Yes, uh, I actually uh, know uh, Ruiz. Oh, okay. Uh, I've, uh, I've, uh, he is a member of the Jack Hanfield's Transformational Leadership Council, which I'm also. I was actually a, uh, I forget what they call them, a, not an inaugural member, a, you know, a founding, founding founding member. But he he's in that group and. Uh, I've I've talked to him a few times, had dinner with him once. Uh, it strikes me that the reason I bring it up is it strikes me that his approach is for agreements and that philosophy. Um, if you follow that, um, it programs you to reach sort of what your definition of awareness is. Well, it certainly it certainly is helpful, and uh, the. Uh, uh, Not as directly as yours, because you're you're actually reprogramming, you know. Uh, uh, neural pathways from the sound of it, but um, from a philosophy standpoint, uh, you know, don't uh, uh, don't make assumptions, don't take anything personally, be impeccable with your word, that sort of stuff. That's right in line with being aware of not and and not prejudging anything, not attaching well, anything and it, above and beyond. And in fact, in order to keep the four agreements, which are be impeccable with your word. Don't take anything personally. Don't make assumptions. Always do your best. In order to do that, you you must be aware. Or to the degree that you're aware, you can keep those four agreements. Because you can't be impeccable with your with your word if your uh, amygdala is running wild and causing you right. to be reactive. It's only when your prefrontal cortex is powerful and strong and uh, you know that you have a choice about uh, you know how you express yourself same thing with taking things personally taking things personally is you know means that your amygdala is running wild and making assumptions is also kind of a lack of awareness because the more aware you are the 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 broader your perspective is and an assumption is a limited awareness you're looking at a situation and you're you're saying well it must be this but if you're more aware, the higher you go up in awareness, the more you say, well, it could be this, 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 this. And you also begin to realize that everybody has a perspective. And, uh, right. you know, you guys, wherever you guys are sitting, you when you look around, you have a different perspective than I have sitting here in my office, looking around my office. But your perspective is just as right, quote unquote, as mine is. It says, you know, it's... It, so, at any rate, the, it, it, being able to uh, avoid making assumptions is also uh, comes from being more aware and always do your best. Um, certainly, that, I mean that involves motivation. It also involves ethics and involves a lot a lot of things that all increase when you uh, when you. You're you're not even going to be aware of what your best could be if you're unaware. So, right? Yeah, you don't know what you don't know. Yeah, you know, one of the things that happens is that through different ways, whatever they happen to be, uh, some people become incredibly aware. And when you're wending your way through life, 
and if, if you are one of those people and you run into somebody else, you immediately recognize them. Mm-hmm. You can really tell that you found somebody else that's really aware. Um, and uh, they may describe uh, where they're coming from in a different way than you are. They may have got there in a different way. Um, but you can kind of say, yeah, this, this person kind of gets it. Um, uh, to shift gears a little bit, Keith and I were just sort of talking on the back channel. Um, since you're really familiar with uh, uh, brain chemistry and structure and, and function, have you run across any um, correlation between holosync and changing bra- brain frequencies and how that may have a direct impact on the pituitary gland in particular? Uh, yeah, the pituitary gland in, I mean, I think of two, two things that you might be asking about. One is the pituitary gland, uh, is where growth hormone comes from, human growth hormone, which a lot of people would like to make more of. Uh, but the other one is that, uh, a lot of people describe that as being the third eye, you know, right, the, 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 seat the, of, the uh, sixth chakra. <clears throat> Yeah, the, the seed of consciousness, it's, it's often tied to awareness uh, and sensitivity and intuition and, the, and that sort of stuff. I wonder if you've seen any, uh, any impact. Uh, I, I, that's an, that would be an interesting thing to look into, but I have not, in all the research that's being done on what I would call awareness, the scientists aren't all calling it that, but um, I have not seen anything involving the pituitary gland uh um there and i'm not even sure if anybody has ever studied whether uh, you know when people meditate uh, there are certain things that happen visually um uh, and what often triggers them is is focusing on that "Quote unquote third eye point that Ajna chakra, um, you know there are uh, there's what it's called the bindu or what uh, Swami Muktananda used to call the blue pearl. There are other things that can happen happen there. I don't know if anybody has ever actually done anything to show that that really is related to the uh, pituitary gland or not." Yeah, I, actually, I need to correct that. I said pituitary because I've got that on the on the brain. Or pineal, the Pine- pineal is what I meant. Yeah, to say, I, yeah, yeah, I, I, I haven't. Uh, uh, you know, I, I'll, I'll, I'll do a little digging around on that. It can, as you got me a little bit curious. Um, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the descriptions in the Eastern philosophy of chakras and this sort of thing. You know, is pre-scientific. Um, right. You know, and uh, it's it's a, a beautiful model in many ways. Um, I don't know that it um, that it really. Dis- you know, I, I'm sure that whatever is happening that they're describing, there is a, uh, a another way to describe the same phenomenon. Um, that would be, sure. you know, and, and they're finding certain things like this in uh, Chinese medicine too. There's there's plenty of things. Um, you know, I have a Chinese doctor that I go to sometime. I used to go to him a lot more, but I don't ever get sick anymore, so I kind of haven't seen him for a while. But <laughs> but but so I'm not negative at all in Chinese medicine. But a lot of the things that uh, that really work in acupuncture and Chinese medicine, uh, there are other explanations that are different than the, than the Chinese medicine model. Um, it, it works in terms of diagnosing people and it works in terms of, of treating people in lots of ways. However, it doesn't really match empirically what they've found. And so, you know, uh, I'm not. I'm not that close to those circles. I do know some people at the. Uh, there's a, a, a Chinese medicine school here in Portland. It'd be interesting to go over there and talk to some of those people, um, who I haven't seen for for quite a few years. I know that one of the things that happened when um, you know when the Chinese pushed the Dalai Lama out of 
out of Tibet. He and a lot of the Tibetan, uh, the other monks, and they became more Westernized. They learned more about Western things. And uh, a lot of the non-scientific things that they had been teaching uh, in Buddhism, they have now changed. And uh, one of the things that Buddhists, I, I forget the exact numbers on this, but one of the things that the, the Buddhists had been teaching, I, this was in a book I read by the Dalai Lama many, many years ago, so I, my memory may be slightly faulty on the details, but he had, um, they had said that the moon was X miles away from the earth, but it was like five miles, you know, some, you know, it, was, <laughs> really? it wasn't, okay. it wasn't anything that was, that was true, uh, or it might have been 200 miles away or something. It was, it was some number that wasn't really right. And uh, some of the, the, the Western students and uh, scientists who were also students since it became students uh, said, no, 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 that's not true. We've, you know, human beings have actually been there and we, we have these methods of knowing and it's, it's really about 240,000 miles away. And he said, oh, well, we're going to have to stop saying that then. And uh, so, you know, the, um, the Dalai Lama, for instance, is a, really a, an interesting case in that he, he's very interested in science and he's very, uh, He's very open to changing some of the things that have been said for thousands of years from a pre-scientific perspective now that there's evidence that, that they're not accurate. And I think the same thing will happen w uh, eventually with uh, the, the whole theory of chakras and all that kind of stuff. You know, I'm not right. saying that there isn't something happening that that method is describing. And it and uh, a lot of people are very attached to that method, and I certainly used to be too, and I and I can speak that language, but um, I have a little more of a scientific bent. And when you look at the research, you think, well, okay, something's happening there, but there's another ex explanation for it that's that's more. It doesn't take anything away f uh, from uh, from it, or that those things are often signposts. Uh, in uh, you know a spiritual awakening, but there is another explanation. For for instance, um, one of the things that people are meditating for is because they want this feeling of transcendence, of oneness, uh, of uh, of the boundaries dissolving, so that they don't feel like a separate item in the universe, but they 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 have the experience of being uh, that there's one thing. And uh, and you're it, uh, and, and instead of a multiplicity of things. They now know that there's a part of the brain um, that shuts off when you do certain meditation practices, and it it's the part of your brain that allows you to to locate yourself in time and space, and also that causes you to feel. Uh, a boundary between your yourself and not yourself. You know what? When we're hmm. in our normal walking around state, now you see uh, in Eastern philosophy under the whole chakra uh, theory, they would describe that as in a completely different way. The the scientists are not saying that's not happening, but they hmm. are saying that when that happens, um, this part of the brain is turning off. While you're having that that uh, that experience, it also turns off when people hmm. uh, take ayahuasca, for instance. If you're familiar with ayahuasca, I was I was just about to ask if there's a correlation there. Okay, um, I have actually don't tell anybody, <laughs> but I've I've done 65 ayahuasca journeys. Wow! And uh, uh, it's a that's a very interesting. Um, very interesting substance, uh, and it does a lot of the same things in the brain that um, that meditation does. And it also, I I believe, having studied flow states, I believe that that after the initial part of the journey, which is very intense, it puts you essentially into the same state as a flow state, where your brain is hyper focused because. Uh, 
when you're on ayahuasca, one of the things that happens is that you know, all this stuff is going on. It's all going on inside of you pretty much. Uh, right. But all this stuff is going on and you go, you know, you're sitting there and, you know, just all this amazing stuff is happening. And then after a while, you kind of say, wow, um, I, I drank this at 6 o'clock p.m. It must be 10.30 or 11 mm-hmm. by now. Uh, so much has happened. And then you, you know, and then it's quarter to 8 or something or 7.30. And you think, what? Yeah, but it's because um, – Everything slows down so much, uh, and it's just exactly like what happens in a, in a flow state. Um, I have been listening to John Coltrane uh, recordings <laughs> when I was on ayahuasca, <laughs> and uh, and I would uh, say, you know, I'm gonna I'm going to watch myself listening to to John Coltrane. And then I thought, I'm going to watch myself watching myself listen to John Coltrane. <laughs> and I wanted to say, how many levels out can I go? And uh, and I actually could go. So I was watching myself, watch myself, watch myself, watch myself, watch myself, listen to John Coltrane. And <laughs> hold all those perspectives at the same time. And so then when I wasn't on ayahuasca, I said, I wonder if I can do that. And I could watch myself listening, but that's about as far as I could go. You know, because just don't have that focus. Well, yeah, yeah because uh, and so when I was writing the book, I learned uh, learned a lot more about the brain science behind flow states, uh, and that's where they really learned uh, about this thing about the, this. It's called uh, it's called transient hypofrontality. Transient meaning it it isn't happening all the time. Hypo right. meaning a, a lessening, and frontality meaning the prefrontal cortex that I was talking about. Um, a lot of it shuts down, so that it's just one part of. It's kind of like if you had to shut off all the all the programs on your computer so you could download this gigantic file. Right. You know, it's so that all the bandwidth is is, or it's kind of what they do with light for a laser. They 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 focus it so much that the light in the laser, uh, they could take the light, you know, the amount of light in a light bulb and focus it like a laser, and it and it you know can burn through something or you know, I'm not an expert on lasers, but uh, you know it's just a a real focusing of all the bandwidth into one way, and uh, so ayahuasca does that too. So, Bill, I know you're pressed for time here, and we don't want to take any uh, any extra time away from your your schedule here on Sunday. Uh, can you uh, give us an idea of what the the best way for folks to find you and your products? Well, if they download the free book, first of all, that would be the what I would have them do: download the free book, and uh, and in there there are links to a uh, Holosync demo and a whole lot of videos I've done about a lot of the things we've talked about. Uh, and some things we haven't talked about, and uh, that you know that'll show them how to how to how to find me. That's the that's the okay. that's the easiest way. Uh, if you can have your folks send over a link to that book, I'll make sure that gets posted. Uh, and bet. we certainly appreciate you coming over. Yeah, uh, coming on the podcast. Yeah, didn't you do this through Babe? Yes, yes, we sure yeah. did. Yeah. Uh, yeah, just just huddle with her and she'll set you up. All right. Well, okay. thanks a lot for coming on and talking to us about. Hey, this, Bill. thanks for the invitation. And there you have it, folks. We definitely uh, appreciate Bill coming on and spending some time with us uh, and, and enlightening us with uh, his perspective on his technology. Really interesting stuff. I'm going to have to – I've been into binaural beats for a while. I'm going to have to go check out the, the Holosync stuff uh, um, very shortly here. So uh, we'll have a link in the show notes to the book uh, Bill was talking about. Uh, if you want to go uh, to his website, you don't have the show notes handy or you can't get to them, you can go to centerpoint.com, which is C-E-N-T-E. E-R-P-O-I-N-T-E dot com, and that'll take you uh, directly to his website, uh, but definitely check out the show notes. We'll have a link to the book there, and uh, um, was a great episode. Thanks for joining us.